I'm Jeremy Rennick, I'm the CXO of Agile Sphere, or one of the CXOs of Agile Sphere, and I'll explain that a little bit later on. Um, as I said in my, as I said in my uh, sort of 20 second pitch, uh, this presentation started from a realization, from sort of, from quite a long time ago, uh, but from the realization of the 10 years I've been spending dealing with large agile programs and large agile transformations, that they all get stuck at the same point. And the same point is basically this. You, it, it summarized in this sort of slide. Basically what happens when you're doing an Agile, when you're implementing Agile for the first time, you do it at the team level. So you do some software development, it starts with software development on the engineering access. Um, people want a bit of governance around it, they work out how to do it. You get a nice team culture going and people sort of say, this is great, we're delivering software much more quickly, much more effectively. Um, so we want to scale this. Now of course scaling the engineering practices is challenging in, its, in itself. We've got continuous delivery in the DevOps movement and we're getting there, but three or four years ago, um, tr as other people have said, that was still a challenge. When you're scaling, you're dealing with larger sums of money. So people are sort of saying, actually, we need some proper governance around this. And okay, we now sort of know how to do agile governance um, and those sorts of things. The problem really comes and where every agile transformation falls over is that when, you re when the senior and mid-level management realize that you're challenging the organization structure and you're challenging the power structures. And like I said, I've been spotting this for 10 years and at that point, you know, my frustration around these sorts of things has been immense. And I'm going, okay, it's all well and good for us as an agile movement to sort of say, this is a really good thing, because we all know it's a really good thing, okay? And we know the organization structure has to change. We know that we, we're looking for self the ability to be empowered, the ability to self-organize, all of those sorts of things. But what we're not doing is telling the senior management and the senior leadership about what they should be doing differently. We talk about empowered leadership and servant leadership and all that sort of stuff, but we're not telling them about how they should change their organisational structure. And um, last summer, last summer I realised what was going wrong, or I think I realised what was going wrong. Uh, and I pulled it together in a presentation with the Agile Business Conference, which I will sprint through. If you want, if, if, so the, the first part of this is replaying the Agile Business Conference presentation. I've cut a bunch of slides out. If you want any more detail on this, um, then I've written the, the presentation up and I can email that presentation out to people and you'll get, you'll get a bit more detail on it. So apologies for the canter through on this, um, but it's, imp I, it's important that I get to actually what happens when you try and implement one of these sorts of things. So. My basic premise is the old organization is is uh, model is broken. You get up the culture axis, you're trying to change the culture of the organization, the organization model gets in the wrong way. It generates the wrong behavior, it can't cope with the complexity and frequency and pace of change, and it reasserts itself. Okay, this is one of the interesting things, and is that this is the, 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 the when I get onto this, this is the bit that people tend to take photographs of because it's the bit that I think other people, other speakers on these topics doesn't real, don't realise. And this is the essential part to actually changing it. So we need a different model. So first premise, structure drives behaviour. Conway's law, Lahman's laws of organisational behaviour, for those that know about these sorts of things, basically refer to the same thing. It's a basic systems thinking tenant that uh, structure drives behaviour. I was sort of chatting, chatting earlier. Um, to the gentleman here, and if you accept that structure at least inhibits behaviour, and you should at least change the structure to allow good behaviours to emerge, then you accept that structure drives behaviour. Won't dwell on it, but you have to accept. The rest of this presentation is based on this tenant. So if you don't agree, then at least suspend belief for a little for, for a little while, okay? And we can we can argue about it over lunch, okay? Um, so let's look at a structure. All standard organisation structure, bunch of silos, bunch of silos with people at the top of the silos and you know, we, we talk about digital and that sort of stuff and we've got people saying focus on the customer. The guys at the top are saying focus on the customer. Of course, if, you're, if your very reason for existence is it, within this organisation is being guided by your manager and your senior manager and if, it's the CF, if you're in finance, the CFO, you're not going to be looking at the customer, are you? You're going to be looking up the organisation, the guys at the top, and because it's a silo, because it's a pyramid, the attributes of the people at the top get amplified by the silo. So if they're really good people, the goodness gets amplified. 
if they're really bad people, they get the, 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 the badness amplified, and of course everybody's a mixture of good and bad, so you end up with these this mixed, this mixed messages. Now, of course, the really interesting thing about this is the chief exec might well be saying focus on the customer because he, you know, he wants increased revenues and bigger bonuses and so on, but actually what he's really worried about is the shareholders. So nobody's focused on the customer, okay? Um, so focus on the customer. The same, is sort of, the same is true in public services as well, um, and the issues in public services actually tend to be more extreme because you're often dealing with people in very vulnerable situations. But uh, there's a couple of slides which I've skipped on, skipped on that, and they're in, they're in the uh, original presentation. When we talk about viable as a movement, we talk about it in the context of minimum viable something. And we focus on the minimum, which is a good technique to try and get people to focus down on what we can get out the door. But viable is a really interesting word, if a somewhat difficult word, because it talks about being able to maintain a separate existence. So actually, how many minimum viable products you put out there that are truly viable, okay? And I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, I was having an interesting debate at uh, lunchtime yesterday about actually the whole concept of minimum viable anything, but let me not get distracted by that. Um, so, uh, so little, 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 little illustration here. Fortune 500, okay? Only 60 of those for, original 45, Fortune 500 are still operating today. Okay? The average lifespan of a company has reduced from 80 years to 10 years. So all of this paternalistic, sort of silo-based organisation was actually quite good in terms of when you had uh, jobs for life, when you actually had people being looked after. You could sort of almost excuse it because there was something there to provide structure and provide familiarity for people. However, if those organisations are failing on too regular a basis, and of course every time an organisation fails, there's a real human cost at the end of it in terms of redundancy, people being thrown out the streets, you look at the Rust Belt of America um, and other places where things are de-industrialised. So it isn't viable. Again, more slides in the pack. This is the, this is the really interesting one. Real, no transformation without structural change. So we go back to our, to our board for trying to focus on the customer. And in the 1990s, we talked about business process re-engineering. You know, I was in the middle of that movement. Great, this end-to-end -end business processes, focused on the customer. In, we then went, came round to it, Lean Six Sigma in the noughties, focus on the customer, we'll look at the end-to-end -end processes. That's basically the same mantra. Okay? What has actually happened to both of those is that actually all we've done is automated the handoffs between the silos. That's all we've done. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because businesses are more efficient and way of staying ahead, but we haven't achieved the original objective, which was to focus on the customer. Now, in the digital world, not focusing on the customer means you're immediately unviable. I know that's a whole bunch of negatives, but I think it's important sometimes to emphasise the negatives. Now, we in the Agile movement, we're not, immune, we're not immune to this. At our best, we do this. We get our colleagues in sales and marketing, we get our colleagues in operations, and we create a great new digital product, that um, digital product with a bit of bricks and clicks going on, we're shipping something real to people, and we're delivering value to a customer every couple of weeks. Really great stuff. The problem is, is that I've had three of my own customers, and I've seen five of other people's customers where this has happened. Or Agiles, the, the, the people at the top that were really espousing digital, were really espousing Agile, basically moved on, you know, went on the conference circuit, something along those lines, and new people came in, and of course it just became IT's problem again. And you go, oh, these are really annoying managers, the, the really annoying senior guys that have come in and sort of destroyed everything that we created. Can't they see it? Of course, actually they can't, because they weren't part of it. So, like I say, eight, eight clients I know of, of this, um, uh, I won't name names, but um, there's, the, the, like I say, there's some interest. In, you know, HSBC's re, um, HSBC's uh, re-implementing Agile at the moment, having had the opportunity to implement it, <laughs> implement what I designed for them in 2011. Hey ho. So the old, uh, the old organisation model is broken. It generates the wrong behaviour. It can't complete, can't cope with complexity, frequency, and pace of change, and it reasserts itself. We need a different model. Thankfully, there is a different model, but it's not well known. It's called the viable systems model. I, I was a systems thinker before I was ever an agilist. I was a system thinker in the 90s. And um, 
Stafford Beer, who created the Viasbrill system model, came from the 1970s. And so there is a model to cope with complexity. He designed it to cope with complexity. And it's derived from both biological concepts, i.e. the human nervous system, the most viable organism on the planet, that word viable again, um, and complexity mathematics. So he derived it separately from both. Okay? And in the books, if you go back to read the books, and they're fairly dense and they're fairly dense and they do take a bit of reading, there are some core agile concepts already in there. Focus on value, feedback, empowerment, adaption, and recursion. They're all in there in the seventh, and it was written in 19, it was originally published in 1973. What I realized last summer is that we actually have, as, part, as the digital agile movement, we have most of the components. So, if we want to focus on the customer, we create a multidisciplinary team, including offline components, non-digital components, and if you're doing it in a lean startup way, you're including your finance colleagues, somebody there to count the numbers. So we actually know how to do this. This is how, uh, this is how every startup gets off the ground. Okay? You actually combine... Uh, you, you actually include your finance, HR, other type colleagues in there, even if you ended up outsourcing them. They're all part of the business. The challenge comes, as I've noticed earlier, noted earlier, is when we're trying to scale to two of these. We need some sort of coordination between these things. Now, again, within the Agile movement, we actually know how to do coordination between two, three, four, a dozen, um, a, a dozen Scrum teams, a dozen Agile teams in that we've got things like Scrum of Scrums, we've got things like Three Amigos type sessions, or Nine Amigos sessions, if you've got three of, three of these sorts of teams. And we've got things like Communities of Practice. Now, if those of you who... It still happens, of course. Uh, but within the IT community, we used to have silos of BA, BA-ness, requirements definition. We used to have silos around developers. We used to have silos of testers. We used to have silos of ops people. Okay. Well, we got rid of them because we knew it was the right thing to do for, um, uh, to deliver software more effectively and more efficiently. So we had to replace, though, but we realised we needed to have some sort of professional discipline, so we had some coordination from the communities of practice around UX, developers, web ops, all of those sorts of things. So it would be really nice if our finance colleagues did a similar sort of thing, wouldn't it? Let's embed the finance stuff in the teams, let's embed the finance stuff in the teams and have a community of practice around finance. Why does that not happen? I'll answer my own question. Why doesn't it happen? Because the person at the top doesn't understand it. The person at the top doesn't understand it and the person at the top sees the threat to his or her own, uh, her own position. And the guys right at the very top sort of get an inclination about these sorts of things, but of course it's the, um, it's the, the middle managers that have ambitions to be right at the top. They sort of say, why am I going to destroy this, this ladder, this progression, uh, while I wasn't there? And you know, they're all nice people. I've not met a nasty accountant. Really, I haven't. <laughs> I've met some misguided ones, but, <laughs> but I've not met a nasty accountant. Accountants are the most creative profession on earth. They can make the numbers say anything. <laughs> I spent, I spent, uh, I, I spent fifteen thousand pounds on an MBA, and the most valuable thing that came out of, or the two most valuable things that came out of it, uh, was uh, was an understanding of business law, um, which means that I haven't had to spend a fortune on account, uh, on lawyers over the years. Uh, the second one was the realization that accountants are the most creative profession on earth. Anyway, moving on. That's a side. That's a, that's a side story. Anyway. And do a similar sort of thing with HR. That would be great too. Uh, and please, let's turn it back into a people function or a people community of practice it would be the better way, better way to describe it. So we've got, some we've got some coordination going on. Now, these teams also need to be empowered. That's the other real big nutty issue here is empowerment. And we talk about empowerment. Let's empower these teams. What we forget to talk about is the accountability that goes with empowerment. You are not spending your own money. You're spending other people's money, and you have to be accountable for it. You know, you sometimes spend, you know, you're spending three, three, five, ten, hundred million pounds worth of taxpayers' money. The taxpayers want to know that it's being spent effectively. Now, the good news is, the good news is, when it comes to money, we do actually have a bunch of accountants that realise 
that the current way of doing things is wrong. It's the Beyond Budgeting movement. You will have heard about them before. The only thing you need to know about Beyond Budgeting, unless you're really interested in it, is that there are a bunch of accountants that know that the current way is going wrong. Is wrong. That's the really important part about the Beyond Budgeting movement. Um, the other thing that we need is transparency, because ultimately, if we're being empowered, the people at the top need to be able to see that actually we're delivering software, that things are actually going the way that we want them to go, and those sorts of things. Now, of course, we know how to do transparency, don't we? We go and put things up on the walls. It's not difficult. It's not difficult. You know, if any agilist, if any agilist comes to me, or agilist, comes to me and sort of say, well, we put everything in JIRA or Confluence, Good God. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, Atlassian now have a decent user, user, user designer, user researcher, a lady who I used to work with at GDS. But she hasn't quite managed to weave her magic on Atlassian yet. Um, but if I see an, ag I see an agilist the same, we put it all in confidence, they are not agile. It is only agile if it's on the wall. Okay? Have you, and, and, and the reason why it has to be on the wall is that you have to give complete confidence to the guys that are paying for this, that actually their money's being spent wisely. It also removes the excuses around not governing these things properly, because you can then turn around to them and sort of say, you want to find what's going on? I won't write you a report because it'll, it'll slow me down and that sort of stuff. Just come down and see what's writing on the wall. Oh, you don't understand what you see on the wall. Let me explain it to you. Let me educate you about how this is done. And the times I've done that with senior leaders, they all, they all turn around and sort of say, actually, this is a better way of doing things. If only I could find more time to spend with you guys, but I trust you. And we've actually got, and we're, what we're talking about here is governance, of course, and we've actually got some definition of, uh, of actually how to do governance in an agile way. Uh, I was lucky enough to be part of the team that wrote the governance for service delivery, uh, for service delivery sections of the GDS service manual, uh, along with Mark Dalgana, who's floating around somewhere in the conference, and uh, one or two of our other colleagues. So we know how to do these sorts of things. They're not perfect, they're not complete, but at least we know we're on the right track. Now we have, I'm gonna build this up reasonably quickly. We, the other bit we need to do is to react to big changes that are going on in the marketplace. That's the lean startup movement. More detail in the picture book and the, the other packs um, because it's not particularly important as far as the rest of this presentation is concerned. And the other part of it is you have to do it within an ethos, identity and purpose. So that's the viable systems model applied to digital businesses, okay? And we have most of the components for it. So we end up, if we do this, we end up with a much more human organisation. We've got ones that actually really care about people or at least understand where people's motivations are. It's a, an organisation that really adapts well. And, and I'll talk a little, and, and that's, that's the important thing of what we've learnt within Agile Sphere. And... It's very, very scalable. You'll have to take my word for it. That isn't, in the, that isn't in the picture book, but you'll just have to take my word for it. It is very scalable. Now, the problem is, I'm coming back to the minimum viable thing. This was the minimum viable organisation. The problem is, is this isn't, doesn't feel particularly minimum to me, and it probably doesn't feel particularly minimum to you. Um, and viable is really a difficult word. So we're, we're renaming this the adaptive organisation. Uh, partly because the adaptive, adaptiveorganisation.com was free a couple of weeks ago and I booked it. <laughs> you know, marketing 101. <laughs> if you're going to call it something, make sure the domain's free or at least you know how much it's going to cost you. Organic organisation, which was the other candidate, was going to cost me four, four, four grand US. Uh, so that's a, that's a no-brainer, isn't it? OK, so it's an adaptive organisation. So we've taken these principles, we've taken these principles and this idea and applied it to Agile Sphere, because we can't, in all, in all seriousness, go and sort of talk to organise people about it and not try and apply it to ourselves. And so Agile Sphere's, um, Agile Sphere will, will probably do about £15 million pounds worth of revenue this year. We're about 100 people, mainly a contra uh, all contractors, small central group, uh, small central group of employees, and we're probably only a small central group of employees because the IR30 regu uh, IR35 regulations say that they have to be. Um, don't we get started on that topic? Um, and um, so we're a representative size. We are large enough to actually be able to experience the problems properly, and we have done, um, but we're not too large for it to be a really massive change programme. It's big enough for us, but it's a mass it, it isn't sort of a massive thing. Um, so 
Uh, the other thing that's important about Agile Sphere is that Agile Sphere was always set up as a mutual organisation. So Hugh Davina and I set the, pro set the business up in uh, 2014. Um, and the other important thing about it is that we're all Agists. We're all practitioners. Um, and the really interesting thing about all of this is we're all practitioners. We set the organisation up to be a truly agile organisation. And you know what? We ended up implementing silos. You know, my big, my big sort of aha moment is when I looked around and sort of said, shit, we've implemented a finance silo we've in, and, uh, and an op silo. And you're going, how the hell have we managed that with five employees? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but the point is, si si silo, silo, so siloness is an attitude. And this is the key thing. So what we have learned so far is the silos are out to get you. All right? OK? The silos are definitely out to get you. And what I mean by this is uh, I've been, I've had, I'm old, or oldish. Uh, I've had a 30-year career. We've all been brought up in the old ways of thinking. All of our mental models are silos. OK? However hard we try to break out of that thinking, OK, particularly, particularly those of us in the Agile movement that want to do things differently, when the push comes to shove, when there's a crisis, when there's pressure, and there's never, there's never not a crisis, and there's never not pressure, we re and we need to do something new, we reach for the old pattern. We reach for the old mental model. And if you're honest with yourselves, you will be doing exactly the same thing. So let's just forgive everybody for complete, com completely implementing silos. Let's just forgive ourselves, OK? Let's just sort of say, fine, you know, now we know what's going on, OK? So once you know it and you can spot that pattern, then you can think of something different. And this is why having a new mental model or a different mental model, the viable systems model, is really important, OK? Because unless we have a different mental model, we can't change. It is impossible to change unless you've got a new mental model. So, having forgiven ourselves and, having for, and forgiving everybody and having forgiven the guys at the top that were resisting the change, uh, resisting the change in my previous implementations, let's actually sort of say, well, what are we going to do about it? We've got this new mental model. So the first thing we realise is that actually advanced lean agile practices are needed. So, don't even think about doing this sort of thing. Don't even think, think about trying to change the silos unless you're actually doing Agile well. You're really mature Agile. And we realize, and so we talk, we talk about core agility. Uh, this is more with my summary of core agility. It, break requirements into small pieces, prioritize those requirements, deliver something that's go live a bull. Okay? Make sure it's a collaborative team with both the business and technology, if you've got technology in there, and make sure there's regular feedback. If you're doing those five things, you're doing Agile quite well. And it doesn't matter which context you're doing Agile in. Whether it's software, whether it's business change, whether it's HR or finance um, or marketing. If you're doing those five things, you're doing Agile pretty well. What we realised is that we'd gone a little bit far away from it. So um, because as a senior leadership team, we didn't have what one of my colleagues called a shrapnel shield. Other people refer to it as a particular kind of umbrella. Um, actually, I've used the word already, haven't I? <laughs> so, so the question is, who provides the shit umbrella for the shit umbrella? The meta shit umbrella. <laughs> OK, because the senior leadership is there to provide, allow the team to get on with it. All of the crap that floats around in an organisation is is there to be deflected by the delivery manager, by, um, the, uh, by various executives and so on, and all the rest of it. So if you're trying to run Agile as a senior leadership team, and I was commenting earlier, I was commenting earlier that the sort of being a member of a senior leadership team rather caught me by surprise when I, because Agile Sphere grew so quickly. Um, there is no shrapnel shield for the senior leadership team. So the lead, senior leadership team has to deal with all of the complexity that we remove for delivery teams. So they have to deal with remote working. They have to deal with constant interruptions. They have to deal with things coming in from left field that need to be dealt with now. So you need to evolve the practices. So, so Agile at a senior leadership level 
has to be more mature than agile at a individual team level. Okay? So, we had a bit of a play around with this, and uh, my colleague Louise, who's sitting over there, designed us a, designed us a, uh, a new Kanban board. Uh, don't worry too much about the detail of that, because I've sort of genericised it in the next slide, which is this. So the two key innovations here... Uh, innovations. OK, well, let's, let's, I'm calling them a little bit grand. Um, is that we have both an incoming, uh, incoming backlog and a backlog backlog. So this is the stuff we plan to do, the strategic stuff. And this is the stuff that just happens. OK? And the key, thing, the key problem we had is the incoming stuff was landing in progress without any of the Agile discipline applied to it. So there was no definition of requirements, no definition of acceptance criteria, um, there was no prioritisation, no sizing, nothing, nothing of that actually going on. It was just landing and pushing all of this lot out, lurching from crisis to crisis. Uh, not quite, but you know what I mean. Um, so all of this stuff was being done. So we're sort of saying, OK, let's be clear about this. If we've got something incoming, let's actually take it through the process. Yes, it will likely still land as in progress, but let's actually think about what's being displaced. And genuinely, it, what's, what's the minimum viable reaction we can have to this particular thing? Is, is there a holding position where, at least for this week, we just deal with whatever we need to do for this week? We don't need everybody's forming on it. Let's, let's, let's delegate it to one person to do it. You see where I'm going with this. Um, so, this and so because we've got stuff just landing in this week, we may have stuff that's already in progress that we have to put on hold. So it's started but not finished. And I was listening to the keynote and talking, talking about listening to the keynote, and I just wanted to yell, you know, it's, not, it's fine for software development teams, but what about the rest of the business? They are the people that have to react to, they, have, they are the people that have to react to clients pretty quickly. The only people in the tech industry that gets anywhere close to that sort of reactionness is, of course, live ops. Okay? And we all get frustrated with live ops because we can't get our bloody software live because they're dealing with some sort of crisis. Okay? Uh, the, other, the other innovation was adding, in a comms, uh, was adding in a comms column to sort of say, it, yes, comms communication should be part of the acceptance criteria. We're not done until we've actually communicated it, but we actually wanted to call it out to say, w uh, when you're dealing with senior leadership teams and business change, it's all about communications. If you don't get your communications right, you lose the benefit of what the change you're making or create other problems. So, advanced agile. The other thing you've got to do is actually make the commitment to switch from function-led to service-led. These two slides came from, were originally in a, slide, in, a, in a pack that I did for DEFRA when I was working on the Common Agricultural Programme. And those of you that have been following that will realise that it crashed and burned quite badly and ended up in front of the Public Accounts Committee. Now, I'm not saying that if they did this, that it wouldn't have ended up in front of the Public Accounts Committee because there were some fairly, fairly fundamental things. But it was at this point that I realised the programme was in trouble because they weren't being... Um, the Rural Payments Agency wasn't committed to switching from function-led to service-led. OK? They wanted to just keep the, the existing functions. So you have to change the power structures. So you have to diminish the power of or change the power of sales technology, finance and ops, the CIO, the CFO, the COO, and appoint a bunch of service owners, service leaders, service managers, whatever phrase you want to do, but P&L owners is probably the best way of describing it, that own the value to the client. Because the client, the environment's moving so fast Unless you're as close to the client as you can possibly get, you will get stuffed by somebody else. Okay? Less of an issue in public services because ultimately, you know, we're, we're a captive audience. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could just decide, you know what, I'm going to be a citizen of Estonia. <laughs> and actually, I'll take all of my public services from Estonia. Because um, actually, they know how to do this. Or uh, out of all of the digital, uh, digital governments, they, they're the ones further down it. So, we're changing the power structures. So, that's sort of, mm, this, is, this is the difficult bit. This is where it all fell, fell apart for me at DEFRA and in, in subsequent places as well. But it's easy for me to talk about DEFRA because everybody knows, knows that it ended up in front of the Public Accounts Committee in a massive row. Um, 
anyway. So, what to do this, I have something that I call ref silo refinement. Now, we talk about breaking down the silos, which is why I use the word refinement rather than breaking down the silos. The, the original title for this was, is, let's break down the silos. Well, everything that goes on in that silo probably still needs to be done. It's very, very rare that something's actually happening now. It's very, very rare for something to be happening in the silo that, has, that doesn't need to be done. Okay, so you just break it down into constituents' parts. Now, isn't that just agile? Let's break it down into its little pieces and, re and work out what we're going to do with it. So within the human resources silo, let's call it people, please, um, there's some strategic stuff. That's what the CHRO or CPO uh, actually does. Do we have enough of the right people with the right skills for the future? They do professional development in terms of uh, providing opportunities for HR professionals to grow. They do compliance. Are, are we actually compliant with the law? You know, are we being equal? Are we not? Are we, yeah, are we being equal and, and other things? Um, standards. They sort of say this is the right way to do things around here, and standards are good for efficiency. And you don't want too many standards because that stops being, or you don't want those implement. You don't. You need those standards to be uh, flexible to client needs. Um, so, you know, a classic one in the people function is uh, some clients want more background checks on the people that go on site than others. So you'll need a different process. Uh, you'll need a different process for SC clearance as a BPSS is, is sort of the classic difference. And then there's the bit that's operational that adds past the value to the client. And of course, what gets, what gets lost in the, people, in, in the people function is that they actually do some really useful operational stuff, hiring and firing, talent acquisition, or <laughs> letting go, coaching behaviours. That's what, that's what a people function should be doing, is actually spending most of their time coaching. It's the bit, because they're, they're already really good with people. You know, HR people tend to be really good with people, and they don't spend enough time doing the bit they're really good at, which is actually coaching people to be better at what they do and realise their dreams and the motivation behind it. And facilitating feedback, again, people, people tend to be quite good at feedback, and so therefore they should be coaching the rest of us on how to do feedback well. Because ultimately, feedback dominates a system, and Agile is all about feedback. We're looking for feedback from our customers. Actually, most Agilists I know are actually quite poor at feedback, so individual person-to-person -person type feedback. Um, and uh, that's, that's, a, that's a subject of a whole different book. Anyway, so... So silo refinement, this is, this is, so what I'm talking about now is, is micro roles. So what we actually want to do, what we actually want to do is all of these things that are actually in the system, there are all of these things that still need to be done. So I use accounts payable, uh, accounts payable and receivable as being the key one, okay? Because we're breaking down the finance silo here. And the key thing about finance is getting paid. Cash is king. If you're not getting the cash in the door, your business is at risk of failure. All businesses fail through cash flow. Okay, there may be root cause reasons that aren't there, but all businesses, Carillion fail because of cash flow. Bell Pottinger failed as cash, cash flow. Right? But the other reason, there were previous reasons there. But when push comes to shove, you can't get the cash in the door. Now, the thing is, is what, we, what I realise within Agile Sphere is that getting the cash in from each of our clients was different. And if we didn't get the invoices right and the reports that went with the invoicing right, we didn't get paid. And these were clients that wanted to pay us. There wasn't any problem with the work or anything along those lines. They wanted to pay us. They have a legal duty to pay us and a particularly strong legal duty in the public sector. And they were quite happy with our work. They wanted to pay us. But they couldn't pay us because we were applying a standard process that was right for one client to the other two. And so therefore, the other two stopped paying us until we actually, did it, we actually did it right. And at one point, we ended up with three months worth of age debt. And in a, small, in a small company, that's a lot of age debt. And not good. And you know. Anyway, so, we have to, so the point being is, is that within the team, you want an accounts payable person. You want an accounts payable person that is focused on delivering that particular value to the client. Okay? 
Um, now that's not necessarily a full-time role. If you're dealing with relatively small teams, actually getting the invoicing right and getting the time sheets right and those sorts of things, you know, two, one, two day a week job at most. So you could get a lot of part-timers if, that, if that's what you want to do. <coughs> but what you could also do is to sort of say, well, actually anybody who's reasonably good at accounts payable is also likely to be good at operations because they're organized, they're structured, um, they, uh, you know, they like order. So sort of onboarding and making sure the timesheets are right. So there's an obvious thing to sort of say, okay, well, let's build up a role that is the, you know, it's a classic PMO type role, isn't it? Once you start adding in things like legal and contracts into it as well, let's build up a role that sort of says operation support or client support or something along those lines. But of course, what you're doing there is immediately uh, changing the context. You're trying to combine things together that shouldn't be combined. Keep them broken apart then you sort of say, okay, this is what accounts payable means for this client. This is what operations means for this client. Okay? And the people, so we're, we're talking about people wearing different hats, which is why they're hats, by the way. Okay? They've been screen grabbed from the, from, the, from, the earlier, from the earlier diagrams. I'll get them drawn properly. I'll get them drawn properly eventually. Okay? So, so, the, so, uh, uh, so everybody wears different hats. Now, of course, you can do it. You can do it the other way, and you can, and you can continue, continue to do it the other way, where one person is doing accounts payable across each one of those three clients. But the important point is that when this person, or this person is doing this client's work, this person is doing this client's work, they are reporting to whoever the service owner is for that client. In our world, it's the client principal. Okay, so that they're not reporting to the head of finance in that role. They are reporting to the client principal because otherwise they cannot stay close to the client. Okay, and that's the really important thing. So I call them micro roles. Everybody has a large number of micro roles. I've got when I when I listed out my micro roles, I got to a list. I got I got to ten and stopped. Okay, and realised I was probably doing too much and not doing not doing some of them very well. Okay, so um, so that's there. The other thing is, is of course, you, 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 what you still need, what you still need, is somebody as head of practice, for example, for talent acquisition. Okay, because you do need that coordination function system to actually sort of say these are the standards and this is how we remain compliant with. Legal, legal stuff. But they could also do, and, and often our best heads of practice when the technology function are somebody that's actually doing the job and really knows how the job's being done in a particular context. Okay? Uh, how many people, domain-driven de domain -driven design, hands up? Okay. Bounded context. Okay? immediately map straight back onto, te uh, onto modern technology delivery. If you don't know about domain-driven design, worth reading a book or two about it. Really important. Very, very important. Uh, particularly, uh, and the concepts translate across. And then for each one of those micro-roles, we're developing micro-role descriptions. So we're looking for the skills and experience that are needed to do that role, the outcomes we're looking for, and if you think about... Um, if you think about... Uh, um, if you think about statements of work for contracts, you can say, we're not, we're not telling you how to deliver this, but these are the outcomes we want. So for accounts payable for our client, we want, we're basically still saying, we need you to get the cash in from the client, and we need you to pay our contractors. How you go about doing it, it will be de defined by the context with which, within which you're operating, i.e. the client's needs and the team's needs. Focus on the user needs. The time commitment that's needed to do it, we, we estimate it will be about a day a week or whatever it may happen to be. The other concept we use very strongly and have always used within Agile Sphere is pairing. Basically, the mantra is if you've, if you've paired with somebody, the right, and this is defining who the right somebody is, but if you've paired with somebody and for whatever reason, uh, for whatever reason it's gone wrong, or whatever reason it's gone wrong, that's fine. Okay? We don't care provided somebody else has taken a look at it. Now, um, you know, the, this sort of concept's going else, uh, uh, being developed elsewhere, but basically it's a, it's a form of empowerment. If you don't provide pairing or something equivalent to that, you're not truly empowering 
because ultimately people then start looking back up the silo. We're sort of saying, OK, you could pair with anybody in the team. To get the accounts payable right, OK, um, a tester's a good person to pair with because a tester's organised and good with numbers and that sort of stuff. The other thing is a review date, and I've, I've, bolded, that for, I've bolded that for a reason, in that if you're going to be a truly adaptive organisation, and, of course, the other thing about... So let me wind this back again. The other key thing about Agile is that we know we cannot predict the future. The furthest we can plan in advance is three months, at best. So why, why, why are we saying you have this job? And that job, uh, uh, that job will exist indefinitely. We're setting an expectation we know doesn't exist. You know, jobs change, jobs move, people want to do different jobs. So let's set a review date or an expiry date to say, actually, let's take a look at this role and see whether it exists or not. If we, you know, our contracts are at most 24 months, so therefore we know that that particular contract will expire in 24 months' time. We will not be doing accounts payable and receivable on that contract in that way for 20, uh, in, in 24 months' time at the beginning of the contract. So why do, we not, why do we think we're always going to need an accounts payable person in that context? So it's a review date. What the other thing that the review date does is give the individual the opportunity to sort of say, you know what, I'm, f I'm sick to death of doing talent acquisition. I'd much rather do something else. And at that point, we're then expiring it. And then as us as senior leaders are actually sort of saying, well, we know that these role descriptions are dis expiring or we'll certainly need review at these sorts of points, Let's take a look at the organisation and make sure we know what we need. And I was making the comment, uh, again, I made the comment in the conversation uh, earlier. I fundamentally believe that in the adaptive organisation, the, the primary role of senior leadership is organisational design. Okay? If you're delegating everything down and people doing the work, that's fine. You know, they're, they're doing the work, you don't have to do the work. All you're doing, servant leadership, is around is around enabling people to, to deliver the best of themselves. All you have to do is design the organisation so they can and reward them appropriately. Well, it's part of designing the organisation, this is. So the other side of this, and I've, got a couple of, I've literally got a couple of minutes just to sprint through this, but I'll just sort of flag this up. Um, the question then is, is what actually happens to the C-suite? Because that's always the big blocker here. What's in it for me? No senior executive is going to turn around and sort of say, oh, this is all great and wonderful. I'm going to do myself out of a job. Actually, one or two do. But uh, in the main, they don't. So let's, let's look at the meta system and sort of say, we've got these things that you can consider to be strategic. And when you look at it without a functional bias, you sort of say, OK, we need to do governance. We need to do some intelligence innovation. We need to do ethos and identity. And when looking at intelligence and innovation, obviously the chief marketing officer's got an interest, CIO's got an interest, the chief people officer's got an interest because they're going to need to know what's actually in there. All of those perspectives need to be represented when you're, when you're starting up a new business. Now, I use intelligence and innovation as an example because it's the clearest example, but you can see immediately that you'd have the same sort of thing with ESOS and identity and purpose. You have to look at the people aspects, the technology aspects, um, the financial aspects, uh, the operational aspects. Same with, particularly the same with governance, because unless you have all of those, uh, unless you have all of those perspectives represented in governance, which function dominates? Finance. In this country. Okay. In other countries, it is, you know, the, the, in other countries it's different, but in this country, unless you have all of those perspectives of represented in governance, it will all be about the numbers. What have we saved? What more have we sold? All of that sort of stuff. Don't give a shit about the people. Don't give, you know, that's, that's a bit harsh, but you know what I mean. So, so what we're actually looking at is replacing the C-suite with CXOs. Multi-talented, T-shaped individuals, T-shaped individuals that can do at least two of those, two or three of those. And th this sort of movement's already starting to, st starting to happen in that I saw something from the CIPD about um, HR, uh, chief HR officers, CHROs, good grief, um, CHROs um, being told that they need to know about finance so they could have a proper conversation with the CFO about finance. Okay? Um, CIOs particularly have always been uh, very interested in taking on, uh, taking on stuff about finance. So that's the CXO. 
That's the input, and that's why uh, me, Hugh, and Davina call ourselves CXOs. And within Agile Sphere, um, you know, Davina loves a spreadsheet. Absolutely loves a spreadsheet, just for spreadsheet sakes. Um, me, <laughs> you know, I can handle a spreadsheet, and I handle a spreadsheet quite well. Um, and and uh, you know, Hugh knows the necess necessity to do it. We all do a bit of marketing, but with different flavours. Um, you know, Hugh's the nicest person on the planet, and so brilliant with people. You know, we have different strengths and weaknesses, but we can all do. We can all sort of cover across. So, in summary, if you want to implement an adaptive organisation, these are the three things I recommend you look at. Okay, be adv be advanced in your agile and lean. Look at the micro roles concept and get your senior leaders to embrace CX owners and get them to come and talk to me about what that really means. Thank you very much. <laughs>